I've been doing academic research for a really long period of time, and you do those studies that sit in academic journals that nerds like Andy and I read sometimes, um, and <laughs> nobody else really. Um, and so I think to me, taking that technology or that knowledge and getting into the hands of the average person is is I'm more excited about doing stuff like that now where I can get people using these really cool tools that have sat in academic settings for a long time mm -hmm. and using them in, in a real life setting. So whether it's in the gym or on the golf course or wherever, um, that's the kind of stuff that I'm, I'm doing a lot of work on now is trying to take these tools and make them useful to, to every single person. Welcome to Barbell Shrugged. I'm Mike Bledsoe here with Doug Larson and Andy Galpin. And we are here at Cal State Fullerton visiting Dr. Scott Lynn. He's a biomechanist, and, uh, which means you study how the body moves and what's firing and what's not firing and, and how to fix it. And Basically, yeah, I'll give you that. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> it's a stretch. Um, yeah, so it's basically the mechanics of a biological system is the um, technical definition. And mechanics is actually defined as the influence of force on body. So mm -hmm. really what we're studying is how forces affect... Uh, and, and there's two ways of biomechanics. We can do things that look at the structure of the human body. So some people look at how forces affect the cartilage in your knee or the discs in your back or uh, the ligaments in your knee or whatever. Um, and then you can look at how it affects your function, so how it makes you lift better and jump higher and hit a golf ball further and all those types of things. So um, a lot of people do talk about it as being just a study of motion, um, but I think a lot of stuff that we do looks at the forces that go into creating that motion. Mm -hmm. um, Newton told us that we can't produce force without an external, or we can't produce motion without an external force. And mm -hmm. most of us, when we're walking around moving, the only thing we can push off of is the ground with our feet. And so we're, we're really, that's a lot of the work that I'm doing is looking at how we interact with the ground and how that produces the resultant motions and muscle activities that allow us to lift and move and mm -hmm. do all those different things. Yeah. Sound way so cooler than what I said. <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, people can make claims all day about, like, you, you shouldn't let your knees dive in when you squat or you round your back when you're deadlifting. That's going to hurt your back because this, that, or the other thing. But until it's actually tested in some way, we, actually, we can measure the forces and or do some type of study. We, we can't really know what the truth, so to speak, is. Sure. Uh, if there even is such a thing as the truth. Uh, yeah, and that's the thing. I think a lot of us, we always teach to the average. So on average, I would say, yeah, rounding your back during a deadlift is terrible. But I've seen a lot of people lift a lot of weight by rounding their back and not injuring themselves still. So mm -hmm. there, there's what we're finding with biomechanics research is there's variability in how human beings do stuff. Um, and so we need to figure out who is the type of person that can round their back in the deadlift and not have a herniated disc and the person who, you know, that's super dangerous. And so um, I would argue that more on average, I mean, I think it's the rare case that you want to <laughs> round your back in the deadlift. I, right. Mm -hmm. that, that is pretty dangerous. And it's not I, something you really want to recommend to go do on To purpose. anyone, no. Like and I think... Uh, can't be too many reasons for that. Right. And to me, I always tell my students, I mean, why do you go to the gym? Why do you lift to get stronger, to get faster, to get healthier? And if you hurt yourself while doing that, that's probably the worst thing that could happen. So, mm -hmm. um, again, unless you're competing, you know, and I think a lot of people do compete in terms of the amount of weight they can lift. Uh, but still, I think we want to try to make it as safe as possible so that you can achieve your goals without hurt, injuring yourself because your performance will really go down if you get hurt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As a coach, I can coach an athlete. I can watch them move. I know what's typical. I've been taught. And through my own experiences, I know how people should be moving, not moving. And there are a lot of exceptions to the rule, like what you were talking about with rounding the back what are what are the tools that you're using that are not your eyeballs to to measure these things so we have a 3d motion capture system right behind us here um, so there's nine cameras that circle the lab um, and as long as two of those cameras at any time can see the little dots that we put on you it can give me the 3d position of that marker in space and so if you think with a normal video camera you can only th see things in 2d mm -hmm. so if I'm looking at this camera here uh, if I do this it can see me but if I do this it looks like my arm gets smaller and then bigger which it doesn't get smaller and then bigger. It's just moving out of the frame that the, mm -hmm. the video camera can see. So I think standard, you know, coaches or trainers or whoever would give people feedback based on video evidence, which is two-dimensional. And so this allows us to see things in 3D. So we can see how things are moving uh, in three dimensions. Um, and it's similar technology that's used in video games and uh, uh, that makes movies. So like... 
those uh, all those animation type movies they have the same thing EA Sports has the same type of system mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so they can and we can do that in our lab here we can remake an animation of you or an avatar of you doing whatever it is that you're doing so mm-hmm. um, that's kind of the goofing around fun part but then we can actually calculate 3D angles and positions of each segment relative to other segments throughout any movement so that's kind of half the game you're doing you're looking at kinematics and 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 position and joint angles etc and then the other half of it is is the forces and loads involved in sport and athletics yeah so the forces that go into producing that motion which to me is a lot more interesting because uh, I do a lot of work in the game of golf and it's been taught kinematically for years. We just watch somebody or we take a video of them and we say, oh, that's, uh, you know, we, you should fix it. You should do this or you should do that. And the analogy we like to give is the kinetics lets you look under the hood a little bit more. Um, so that would be like if your car's not working properly, just taking a video of it driving down the street and saying, ooh, this is what's wrong with it. <laughs> right. Uh, you're just guessing, right? Um, versus when you look at the kinetics, that allows you to open up the hood and, and really see what's going on underneath there that's driving the motion that you're seeing. So a kinematic approach would be something like um you know you're you're doing this in the pole fix this part of your back right right? where the kinetics would be something like the reason that's happening to your back is because you're you're putting too much force on this side and it's turning you this way totally something like that exactly or there's too much you know pressure in your toes or you're way too much onto your heels or Mm -hmm. um and i think it's a combination of the two so we do a lot of things with joint torques or joint moments so it's looking at where the force is relative to where your joint is in space and that's going to determine how your muscles respond um and react to that and so it'll determine you know whether your glutes more active in your squat or your quads more active in your squat and to me i would argue i mean a quad dominant squat has been considered a bad thing for a lot of years Mm -hmm. um and so a lot of the work we're doing in here is trying to get the bigger more proximal more powerful muscles involved because i think it'll make you stronger and more resilient to injury so uh we talk about that as being a a more efficient movement if we're preferentially activating bigger, more proximal muscle groups. Um, Because we know that, you know, force production is related to cross-sectional area. And if we can get the glute, which is, I mean, I have some studies where they've dissected cadavers and looked at cross-sectional areas of muscles. And if you add up all of the quads, they're not even like a quarter of what the glute is in cross-sectional area. So Mm. um, to me that if we're using bigger, more proximal muscles, that seems to be the way we're designed to move. But And more proximal meaning? Closer to the midline of your body. Uh, right. And if you think about it, if you look at your body, like look at your bicep versus your forearm, which one's bigger? Well, generally as we move further away from our bodies, things get smaller um, and less powerful. And so if we're going to move, it's probably better to, to use the bigger, more powerful muscles to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's going to be a more efficient movement that will hopefully keep you safe and, and also make you stronger. And, mm-hmm. and I think I think I don't think those things are a trade-off. Um, I think if we if we move efficiently, we'll be strong and fast and and also uh, resilient to injuries. Uh, Andy was mentioning that you had looked at the differences between front squats and back squats at one point, and they they seem to be very similar in many ways, but they're they're same same but different. They're obviously not the same, but they're right. very similar. I mean, they're obviously both using the you know the hips and the knees and and quads and glutes and, and hamstrings. Like all those muscles are firing and all all those joints are moving, but yep. they're not quite the same thing. No. Uh, what, what did you find when you were digging into those two movements and how they're the same and how they're different? Well, so th- this kind of originated from uh, when I was doing a lot of personal training myself during grad school, I found that you could improve somebody's squat movement patterns pretty easily by just giving them dumbbells in their hands and having them bring the dumbbells in front of them as they squat it down. Mm-hmm. Um, so I call that like a counterbalance squat. So where you bring mm-hmm. the dumbbells up in front of you. Mm-hmm. Um, so increasing the weight that is forward um, actually is going to shift where you're putting force into the ground. So your force kind of shifts a little bit forward, which allows you to stick your hips back. If you think of like a teeter-totter, Um, sticking your hips back with that weight forward balances itself. Right. And so sticking your hips back actually increases the torque on your hip um, and allows the glute muscles to work harder as relative to the quads. Um, mm-hmm. And so we did a, a study where we looked at just having the weights on your shoulders and doing like body weight squats and then doing the same thing with those same weights and just bring them up in front of you. Mm. And we got way more glute activation uh, and less quad and more external load on the hip in the counterbalance squats, which is what we thought. Mm-hmm. And so then we did... we carried on that same theory with the front and back squat. So, sorry, just just to clarify, uh, sure. because it was either basically a, what we call it, maybe like a goblet squat kind sure. of thing. Yeah. But just with dumbbells. Right, like so two dumbbells in the rack position. Um, similar to, it was one of the CrossFit movements this year, right? 
they had to do something with the two dumbbells right here for the games for the open. Uh, they did. I don't remember exactly what it was off the top of my head, though. So something that yeah, moment. Something Anyways, like that. Yeah. that compared to a squat where you have to lift kind of the weight up yeah. as you're going down. So it's ex it's in front of you, but it's extended out, right. you know, a foot or however long your two feet, how long your arms sure. are. And the problem with that is, I mean, and when we tried to publish it, we sent it to the Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research, and the reviewers came back and said, well, you're really limited in loading that squat up based on how much you can flex front right. your shoulder. Right. Front right. Delt raise your shoulder. So, sure. and we we're like, yeah, I mean, totally. So we said, you know, this could be used as like a movement prep or like a warm up to, to you know activate the pattern that you then use when you load it up a little more. Mm -hmm. um, and so then we went on and did a study. My grad student did a study this year looking at front versus back squat because by that same rationale, having the weight in front should allow you to stick your hips back a little bit more and use more glute and less quad, which I would argue is a more efficient movement. Um, the problem is we we had a, a small number of people. So I think the fact that the weight is a lot closer to us. So the difference between the front and back squat where that weight is, is a min minuscule difference. So the effect size, if we talk about statistics mm -hmm. was a lot smaller and we have a smaller effect size, you need a lot more people. Mm -hmm. um, and this was just a student that did a, you know, undergrad thesis project. So it, we didn't have enough people, I don't think. So we're collecting more data to hopefully find a, a statistical difference, but it, it seems logical to me that it would mechanically be that way. But I think a lot of this could be affected by shoulder mobility or the ability to stay stabilize your scapula or because it, it is an inherently a lot more stable position to have it on your traps on the back there mm -hmm. and that might make people feel safer and then they might move in a different way because what we're finding is a lot of times in biomechanics there's there's tons of variability in what human beings hmm. do and how they do it um, and so I mean it could be limited by your ankle range of motion so if you have mm -hmm. a decent mobility in your ankle you could be able to load a front squat properly and stick your hips back the way you need to and if you're limited in your ankle dorsiflexion then maybe you got to adapt and do it some other way so um i think um and again when you read research you have to realize that that's like an average we're saying so on average when people do that counterbalance squat we call it they activate their glute more than than the other way um doing it with the what did you call it goblet squat kind yeah. of deal or whatever mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um but again that is an average so there are, are going to be outliers that are going to do the complete opposite of that too so we have to implementing research and practicality is um you have to realize that the research is generally you know done to the averages so mm. and it's based on the population you test too so mm -hmm. um and that's something we were talking about with this study um i think we just tested like kinesiology students who weren't really super you know effective lifters or, or have lifted a lot so um, that could be something that maybe affected our results as well but mm -hmm. the theory is is pretty good that you know it, it would seem logical that moving the the weight forward however you you have that weight would allow you to stick your hips back a little bit more and create a little more load on the hip and which is surrounded by much bigger musculature which would technically seem to be uh, a uh, better yeah. a better a more effective movement and i think also the the external rotators, the big muscles, the hip externally rotate your femur. So uh, I'm, well, I mean, uh, uh, that internal rotation of the femur that causes the valgus kind of motion or having your knees come together is, is considered to be a pretty inefficient movement and has been shown to lead to a lot of different injuries. So, mm -hmm. um, so again, loading your hip in the sagittal plane by, you know, sticking your hips back, you get that side benefit of hopefully preventing external rotation of external yeah. rotation. Yeah. There you go. Mm -hmm. So if you're, if you're sitting back more, you get naturally just more external rotation. Um, yeah, well, you get more activation of the muscles that, and I don't know if they really cause external rotation or they just absorb internal rotation and keep your knee from mm. collapsing inward. So I think they, um, you get that side benefit where your quads have no chance of doing that for you. I mean, mm. people used to talk about VMO and vastus lateralis helping, but all they do is pull the patella and the patella acts through the middle of the of the tibia and that just pulls your tibia forward. So yeah. their knee extensors, they can't do much in the frontal or transverse planes at all. Right. When you're measuring muscle activation, what tools are you using for that? Um, so we use a, a technology called electromyography. Um, so basically you put two electrodes similar to, I don't know if you've ever seen somebody get like an EKG. Yeah. So they put two electrodes somewhere near the heart and it gives you the little electrical activity of the muscle. It's basically the same uh, technology, but you put it uh, on the skin. Um, near the muscle group. Um, so that's electromyography. It measures the electrical activity of the muscles underneath those sensors. Um, and the problem with that is, with skin sensors especially, is there's a lot of stuff under there. Mm. Um, if there's adipose tissue or any fat between the muscle... And Not the on me. No. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be an excellent sensor. <laughs> Never heard of it. <laughs> Mike's actually 100% pure muscle. Right. There's yeah. nothing in him besides Perfect. muscle. Yeah. No bones. No brains. No, <laughs> no brains. Definitely <laughs> no brains. All muscle. <laughs> muscle and testosterone. The term meat hook came from him. Right. Yes. <laughs> Okay, but so it's, so uh, when there is fatty tissue there, it, that can make the signal a lot more difficult to get because mm. it kind of dampens it. I mean, if you think of 
if you take your speaker at home and you put a pillow on top of it, right. the sound doesn't get out quite as well. So mm. that's kind of what EMG activity with uh, adipose tissue on top of it. So the uh, the gold standard is to put a needle right into the muscle mm. and measure the EMG that way. But that is uh, not so comfortable and then not really possible to move normally after that. And, and that's right. one of the problems right. with biomechanics mm. is we put all this shit on you and we say move normally and you're like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> but it mean, 85 even markers <laughs> on me. <laughs> even exactly. if it's taped on, it's like, uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Like, now I'm a robot. You feel. It's yeah. true. So I think that's where um, the technology is getting better and better to where it's a little less invasive and and uh, and there's a lot more technology now being available, you know, for consumer use uh, outside of the lab because I think that's one of the biggest problems is a lot of this cool technology that allows us to look under the hood and see how people are moving um, was only available in academic settings like this. So mm-hmm. there's a lot of different companies now that are trying to develop this for, for the average show to use in the gym or in their basement or wherever. Mm-hmm. What are some so of the mis... Oh, it, go ahead. I was going to say misunderstandings or misinterpretations of EMG because a huge amount of coaching talk is about what exercise gets this muscle activated more or that activated more. So whether they know it or not, EMG is a very a cornerstone of why you do something or why not to do something. Right. But it's often extremely misinterpreted. Right. Uh, so what are the pitfalls of those things and how is it appropriately used? Well, and I was going to say something really similar, so I'm going to jump in with this. So, yeah. yeah, on par with his question, how does that, how does muscle activation as measured by EMG relate to actual force production and or progress from training? Right. Mm-hmm. That That's, those are really good questions that I don't yes, think a lot did, of Doug. us yes. Good job. have the answers <laughs> to. Nailed it. We nailed it. Um, <laughs> I don't know if we we have those answers because to me, um, and th- we've talked about this quite a bit. So if you let's say you have you know an eighty percent of your maximal activation in like a bench press of the pec muscle, mm-hmm. and you measure that through EMG, and then you work out for a long time and get stronger, mm-hmm. generally with that same load, you're going to need less activation of that muscle because it's using less of its optimal capacity. But then you might come back and say, wait, I was at eighty percent two weeks ago and now I'm at 60%, am I doing worse? Because a lot of people would assume 60% is worse than eight. If I got 60 in class and you got 80, you did better than me, right? When? <laughs> when? <laughs> <laughs> but that's where we have to understand it in terms of, um, and I think that's where it gets confusing in terms of using it. Because mm-hmm. um, generally when we use EMG in a research setting or even in a practical setting now, um, we use it compared to your maximal activation. So you'll do maximal activations of all your muscle groups and then we can say, like that exercise activated that muscle to 80% of your maximum. Right. So there always has to be some form of a reference contraction. And then another problem with it is, um, especially surface EMG, is there's a lot of crosstalk that could happen. Because hmm. there's, it, it's going to pick up electrical activity from anywhere under that muscle. And it could be, you could say my bicep was active at this percentage. And you're like, well, how do you know that wasn't your brachialis muscle or your brachioradialis muscle? Because yeah. those are kind of close there and there could be some crosstalk feeding over. So if you're measuring glute activation, you, you have a, you have a reference max voluntary contraction. Yeah. Just, I have leads on my glutes and I'm, I just squeeze my butt as hard as I can and, and, um, and it measures. Yeah. Generally like we'll that? do, uh, it depends. Sometimes like I was taught in grad school to do my maximum isometric contractions. So we used to do like donkey kicks. Mm-hmm. We would lie people down on a bench and then have them flex their knee to 90 degrees and I would resist their heel and they would try to donkey kick backwards. Gotcha. Because that was where we found we could maximally activate the glute. Right. Um, and somebody would like s- hold their foot down so they couldn't move. Gotcha. gotcha and you just gotcha. had to push as hard as you could. And so, um, and what, what we'd find when we did that is we would always have electrodes at a bunch of different muscles and sometimes we would get a maximal activation in exercise where they're actually trying to activate a different muscle. So like, <laughs> right. Cause a lot of time in the donkey kick, you get max hamstring and not even max glute. And then the max glute would happen somewhere else. So right. this is all part of the, um, and so what I'm talking about a lot with, um, a lot of this work that I'm doing now is with a company named Athos up in, uh, Northern California. Um, they've created a way to take EMG out of the lab and put it in real life. So now they have these compression suits that have EMG electrodes in them. So as you're moving around working out, it collects the EMG, it ships it to the cloud and then sends it back to your phone mm-hmm. in real time. So you can see how your muscles are active and when. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of the work I'm doing with them is how to interpret this information so that we can use it. And so absolute activations of EMG is like... It, there's a lot of variability in it and it, it, it can be, there's a lot of error and there's there's a lot of misinterpretations that can happen. Um, so what we're doing a lot of is like ratios. So to me, if you squat and your activation ratio from glute to quad is shifted towards the glute, that's probably a good thing. As I said before, we want more proximal, bigger muscles to produce the same mm-hmm. movement. 
And so that's what we're doing. We're dividing like glute activation by quad activation mm -hmm. and hoping over time that ratio goes up. So the absolute numbers don't matter, but if you divide them by each other, you're probably producing a more hip dominant and less knee dominant movement, which to me is probably a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what we're trying to come up with now is a lot more ratios and things that we can say here, wear this thing. And if this number goes up, you're probably doing something good in your squat. Mm -hmm. So the coach could be just sitting there looking at the app while, while, while he's watching the athlete go do jerks or whatever. And he, sure. he can see that what the activation is with the upper trap, lower trap, sorry, anterior as, as they're catching the load overhead. Yeah. Et cetera, well, so the, <laughs> that's where um, the, the s there's complications with this suit because it's just a compression gear. So they're, they're having trouble with contact of certain muscles. Mm. So I don't think they've figured out serratus anterior yet. Um, mm -hmm. They did have upper trap previously. I don't think we have lower trap yet. Um, so there's, yeah, there's different muscle groups that are available right now, but they're, they're going to try to add more as they go. But um, yeah. yeah, you mm -hmm. could definitely do that. And there, there are coaches I know that are using it currently with like screens up in the gym. Um, mm -hmm. All my motor learning buddies tell me it's better to learn motor tasks with external cues than internal cues. Mm -hmm. So me telling you squeeze your glute is an internal cue because your glutes start at part of you. Yeah. But if I point at the screen and say, see right here, make that red. And then you got to figure it out on your own. What do I got to do to make that? Oh, shoot, that's what I got to do. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a really good external cue to use to teach you or to have you learn better, basically. Because mm -hmm. yeah. um, if, I, if I say squeeze here, um, you know, and I point to somewhere, I talk about somewhere on your body, the motor learning people tell us that that's not the best way to learn something. Whereas this is a good external cue. So if mm -hmm. I just show you a screen and say, see this right here, this little dot, make this red. Mm -hmm. And you got you got your phone in your hand. And you're like, how do I do that? Oh, shoot. <laughs> <laughs> Andy, you were asking a uh, question. Yeah. So uh, I wanted to uh, jump back into something you mentioned earlier, which is that we all move really different. Yeah. And I want you to actually talk about, I know you've done some studies looking at different positions for glute bridges yeah. and things like that. And so I want to get there eventually. But first, I want you to talk about how you, that gear, that, that wearable EMG, when you can see that feedback, what it allows you to do is say, for example, um, if we all had problems activating our glute and a coach prescribed us all a, a single leg glute bridge, for example, that might get the three of us to activate our glutes very well but right. the fourth it might be a terrible one exactly this software allows you to look and be like okay look which one are you doing it? instead of me arbitrarily picking or guessing which exercise you sure. need you can actually just figure it out on your own because you get that feedback or you could like mm -hmm. trial and error right you could just say twist your foot out a little bit oh yeah don't do that do this a little bit or whatever right, right. so like if it, say you get a certain amount of activation with your foot straight i mean you say well, well it's an external rotator maybe if i twist my foot out i'll turn on a little bit more and if it does well look we found something mm -hmm. and if it doesn't oh fuck let's go the other way so right yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, so it gives you, you that immediate feedback and so you're not guessing really right. so right. um and so that's why i like I mean, I've I've been doing academic research for a really long period of time, and you do those studies that sit in academic journals that nerds like Andy and I read sometimes, um, and <laughs> nobody else really. Um, and so I think, to me, taking that technology or that knowledge and getting into the hands of the average person is is I'm more excited about doing stuff like that now, where I can get people using these really cool tools that have sat in academic settings for a long time mm -hmm. and using them in, in a real life setting. So whether it's in the gym or on the golf course or wherever, um, that's the kind of stuff that I'm, I'm doing a lot of work on now is trying to take these tools and make them useful to, to every single person. Yeah. Uh, if someone was to do what you just talked about, they, they have uh, that, that whole setup where the apps on their phone and they, they do glute bridges or front squats or whatever, they, they can see the data and where yep. the graphs are heading and yep. what's activated and what's not activated. But, totally. Uh, the, the, the art of it all really isn't actually interpreting what the hell that really means and, sure. and why it's happening. Right. And that, that's where I think most people are going to fall short. They don't, they don't have the background to know why it might be happening the way sure. that it is happening. So like when someone reads a research study or, or they, you know, or a journalist reads a research study and they write about it in an article or, or what have you, like how, how are, how is someone supposed to know how to interpret? Yeah, the, that's the data? tough. That's tough. Cause I think a lot of times journalists butcher studies as well. I think I don't know, a couple of years ago they had did a study and mm, uh, mm -hmm. the journalist said that, uh, eating one egg a day is just as bad as smoking a pack of cigarettes a day or something like that. And that came out in like, I forget what. And, and the journal, or the I remember th that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the uh, uh, the author like is like, whoa, like that's not what I said at all. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's such a tangible headline or, or, or quote to, to snip it out of something totally. where like that's going to get blown up and go viral all over everything. But uh, the data didn't support that. And I don't know how, the, I, I don't know the whole story about how they got from the data to that. But um, so you have to be really careful about 
journalists and uh, some publications that aren't so academic. Kind of. Well, you've done a lot of media. I, yeah. I know I have. Almost every single time I've done media about a study, it's when it comes to print. I'm like, that is not at all. What? What? Like, no. how the hell did that happen? Right. We, we proofread this seven times, yeah. and then somehow. And like, especially when you do media like you know tv media like you talk for 27 minutes and they put 30 seconds on tv and they pick that one thing that you said like oh, well maybe it could be and they cut out that part and then they yeah. take the thing that they wanted you to say it's a lot of context <laughs> yeah, yeah. <too. laughs> yeah. Well, totally what i find to be really uh like exciting is and, and i've been looking at some uh what's happening in medicine especially with technology is a lot of the technology is being more widely distributed so the researchers get way more data totally because yeah. as of right now the majority of research is conducted with 18 to 22 year olds because mm-hmm. that's in, a college in a university yeah. <laughs> right. we give them extra credit and they volunteer for a couple extra points on their next test what yeah. do you think these so kids are doing <laughs> <over here>? yeah, <laughs> it's actually a, a pretty small sliver of the population 100%. right and so now we're going to get a much larger pool right and that's what we're saying in terms of the variability so when there's more variability in your population if not everybody does the same things you need more numbers to answer those questions and yeah. so when we're um, yeah when we're doing it on 20 university kids with most of our studies are because that's kind of a convenience population that gives you limited you know take home messages because it only really applies in those 20 right. people and and if there is lots of variability it's hard to find differences in those 20 people so you need more people and then so that's a, that what we're running into with our front squat study is that I think that the effect size or the change between taking the back squat to the front squat is so small you need a lot of people to to determine if there is a real difference there yeah hmm. Uh, earlier, you were saying some really interesting things around the functional movement screen and, and some studies that have been done that um, show certain things. Can you right. dig into that a little bit? Sure. So um, I always tell my students, if you if you ever are reading the research and you want to discover if um, a differences in movement patterns lead to whatever, a different type of injury. So that's what a lot of the stuff with the functional movement screen is. I think uh, Greg Cook would tell you it's not there to decide who's going to be the best athlete it's generally there to tell you who's at the highest risk of injury Mm -hmm. i think that's what it's been designed to do um and so you need to read these prospective studies um my students always joke with me when we're in canada we call that prospective (laughs) um we'd say perspective pros prospective Perspective. perspective. Or say, I'd say perspective. So you, <laughs> but I grew up in Washington State, so I'm uh, pretty okay. close to Canada. Yeah, yeah, we're Canada. almost Canadian. So like process yeah, versus Canadians. process. Process versus yeah. process. Oh, we would not say process. So I, I know uh, way too many ma- Canadians. Yeah. You also say pasta. Pasta. No, we don't say that. <laughs> pasta. <laughs> <laughs> pasta. We say pasta. Oh uh, no, I do know a Canadian. I have a Canadian friend that says pasta. Pasta. Yeah, pasta. Yeah, yeah. That's like a Boston thing. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> yeah. A funny story about that. So when I first taught here, the very first semester I moved from Canada, mm-hmm. um, there was a button in the software reviews in our biomechanics class that had that word on it, P-R-O-C-E-S-S. And the mm-hmm. first time I was teaching in front of like 30 university kids, I said, so push the process button. They're like, what'd you say? I said, process. And they all died laughing. <laughs> <laughs> you have no idea what's going on. Saying that that's not the right word. It's process. And yeah, so process. for the rest of um, when I started teaching for a bit, I would write P-R-O-C-E-S. Or I took P-R-O on the board out. And I would go in front of the class and write P-R-O. i say, say that word. They'd be like, pro. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd write C-E-S-S. And they'd say, so how does that turn into process? You don't say, like, Tom Brady's a pro football player. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> and so I would do that before, like preemptively before every class to show them obviously that I'm right and you're wrong, right? <laughs> you're right, clearly. <laughs> and then I did that in one of my younger classes and then a, a student had taken that class and progressed on to another class. So I did it in this older class and I got halfway through it. I wrote PRO on the board and the student's like, the student actually walks up to the front of the class and he's like, give me your, your uh, marker. I was like, what the hell is he doing? I was like, all right, here. I give him the marker. He writes PRO on the board. He's like, say that word. I say pro. Then he writes mm. B-L-E-M. I'm like, shit. <laughs> yeah, He's like, game. you don't have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> I think nobody would say that. He got yeah. you. Yeah. So I, I get, like, I get stuck on that word a lot, process. I don't know how to say it. I say it with like a southern twang now just to get <laughs> the, <laughs> the merc and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> process. Um, so like a, a prospective study would be um, if we tested a whole bunch of people's movement patterns mm. when they were healthy, like at the start of a season, mm. Mm. and then you track the injuries throughout the season, and at the end of the season you say, these people got injured and these people stayed healthy, could we have predicted that based on how they moved at the start of the season? Mm. Those are the most powerful studies. And there's several of those on the FMS. So there's some on, on football players, NFL football players, they did a study on that. That's the one where they came up with like mm-hmm. 14 as mm-hmm. the cutoff, saying if you're above 14, you're less likely to be injured below you right. are. Right. Uh, they've done it on military trainees. There's been a whole bunch of different studies that have basically shown that if you score higher in the FMS, you're less likely to get injured. Mm. Um, and 
right before we did our study, they did a study at a university on a whole bunch of, like the whole university athletics population. So they had golfers and basketball players and volleyball players and track athletes, and they just threw them all into one pot, and they found nothing. Like there was no prediction of injury. And then we came and did ours. And so I did mine with a student who was the uh, athletic trainer for the track and field team. And we did the sprinters or the, the runners on the track and field team. So it was the long distance runners and the sprinters. And um, I don't know if you know this, but track and field athletes are like Derek Zoolander. Um, they go straight and turn left. They're like NASCARs, <laughs> right. basically. <laughs> right. And I always tell my students, NASCARs are great because you can go into the pit stop and change the tires around, right? Because obviously the, yeah. the wear is going to be uneven. Side, right, yeah. mm -hmm. And so you can go into the pit stop with a NASCAR and change the tires around. That's not possible with a human, right? right? So right. Um, they have a very low variability in what they do every day. If they just run straight and turn left, they're, they're producing the same stresses over and over and over again, which I think is probably going to cause a lot of injuries. And we actually did find a ton of injuries. I think there were more people that season on the track team that got injured than that didn't. Wow. Um, which oh, is, wow. yeah, ridiculous. Um, but you, what wouldn't, we did, you wouldn't predict that in a sport like track. You're like, how are you getting hurt there? Like, there's well, no and that's the thing with that. The best part about that is you're not getting hit by a linebacker. Right. Like, there's no linebacker running into the side there's of your no trauma. You're not hitting into the boards of a hockey player or whatever. Like, so there's no trauma. It's just repetitive stuff that builds up over time. Um, and so those are the ones that we can predict, right? If um, I do a lot of, or I've done a lot of research into Shirley Sarman's work, and she calls <coughs> two types of injuries pathokinesiologic, where the pathology causes altered movement. So that's where, like, mm -hmm. I always show Willis McGahee getting hit in the road or in the Right. Fiesta Bowl there, right? Not much you can do about that. When a 300-pound guy hits the side of your leg, going full steam ahead. If you've never seen that injury, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Oh, boo -hoo. Not good. And then yeah. if you think of uh, Marcus Lattimore, too, that one that yeah, a couple yeah, yeah. years ago, that's, uh, I always show those ones because they're nice and gross. Yeah, and they, legs get broken half yeah. and stuff. Yeah, <laughs> that kind of stuff. Right. Well, they, they say... Uh, Marcus Lattimore got the unhappy triad, ACL, MCL, medial meniscus, and yeah. Marcus Lattimore had the unhappy everything. Like yeah. his, his leg was literally holding together by, I think, a little st strand yeah, of PCL. Yeah, it was, like, it was like borderline amputated. Yeah, totally. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Yeah. And then he yeah. came back and played for a while yeah. in the NFL. That was unbelievable. Yeah, like, yeah that guy is a complete uh, specimen. But yeah. it's too bad that that happened because he, I think he could have been. Sure. He could have been something. Um, anyways, where was I? I don't remember. Remind oh, the track athletes, <laughs> why? Uh, oh, right, they right, turn right, left every the time. The two different types of injuries that, sh that Shirley. Oh, Simon Shirley Simon, about. right. Yeah, right. I was. Okay. So, um, <laughs> so the pathokinesia are the ones you can't really do much about, right? Getting hit by a truck or something. But the right. kinesiopathologic is where inefficient movement patterns build up over time, and there's little micro traumas that happen over time and eventually cause a, uh, sorry, little micro traumas that build up and cause a macro trauma. So right. um, I show a video of David Beckham uh, when he played for, mm. I think he was on the Galaxy at the time, but then he got lent to AC Milan. Mm. I don't know how that works. I'm not a big soccer fan. So there's not many other sports where you get lent to another team. Yeah. It's, it's pretty awesome, like, actually. It's not like Steph mm. Curry is going to be lent to the Barcelona, whatchamacallit, <laughs> for the offseason. <laughs> for the offseason. I didn't know that was a thing. No, yeah. I didn't either. Uh, yeah. I, think, yeah. I think that's a thing because I know at the time he was with the LA Galaxy, but then I, he got hurt playing for ac milan or yeah. something i don't know i don't mm. i don't know how it works anyways i don't really watch sports so <laughs> there don't, you go. don't let me tell you wrong <laughs> <laughs> but he literally he tore his, his achilles tendon uh several years ago and literally the ball came to him and he stopped it with his foot and he stepped back like this and <coughs> his achilles tendon popped yeah. Yeah. And everybody's wondering like how did his achilles tendon top like doing mm. that little motion well it wasn't that little motion it was all the shit he'd done for probably years before that that caused yeah. those little micro traumas that build up and this is what we were finding in these track athletes nobody was hitting them they were just getting hurt by these little things that build up over time. And um, so we, we went in, we collected all the data, and then we analyzed the FMS at the end and compared the people who got hurt to the people who didn't. And we found the opposite of what everybody else had found previously, that the people who scored higher were more likely to get hurt. So the people who moved Generally better... Generally higher is better. Yeah, yeah right. the people who moved better by FMS criteria got hurt more than the people who moved not as well. Mm -hmm. And I remember seeing that. We had a stats person do this for us because it's a pretty complicated statistic. And I got the results back and I was like... Holy shit, how do I explain this? I have no idea. Yeah. But then I went to the literature and I started looking and I was like, wait, it looks like all these sports where they're showing that if you move better, you get hurt less are mm. variable sports. So like, there's been an NFL athlete. So explain to me what an NFL athlete does. Like movement-wise, they run forward, they run backwards, they fall down, they get up, they, they everything, right? They jump, like, lateral, 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 lateral like transition. They move yeah. in every single plane right. all the time. It's just a random chaos. Yeah. Um, how about a, like military trainees? So there was a military trainee study where they yeah. found the same thing. They're jumping up walls. I don't know what military trainees yeah. do, but they crawl under those things. and <laughs> They do a bunch of different <laughs> stuff. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, totally. So mm. to me, um, so I went back to this guy um, – a really prominent biomechanist named Joe Hamill was at the UMass Amherst. Um, and when he retired, he did the keynote lecture at um, 
the U.S. or the American Society for Biomechanics meeting. And basically what he said was, when I started my career, I assumed that the more variable movers are going to be the ones who get hurt more often and the less variable movers are going to be the one who stay healthy and what he's found in his research is that actually is not the case so what he found is there's an optimal level of variability and i think this is true with anything it's kind of like the state of the extremes the, the yeah. three bears right too hot too cold and right. in the middle somewhere yeah. um, and right. in the middle somewhere goldilocks. Is just right. goldilocks. Goldilocks. goldilocks there we go <laughs> <laughs> that's the one um so in the middle somewhere is going to be just right and so this is what he's finding with variability if you have too much variability you're going to get hurt and not enough variability you're going to get hurt but if you're in the middle somewhere you're going to be okay mm -hmm. and so to me if you're a football player and i think you can get variability from what you do every day or how you do it so what you do every day is basically the sport you play and the demands on how you move or what you have to do to play your sport or to train for your sport or whatever and then how you do it is your movement patterns and so to me, if I'm a football player and I have a very, or a really variable sport, that puts me above in the too hot range or whatever you want to mm. call it. Mm. But then if I move really well on the FMS, which makes me a more consistent mover, that moves me back down into the normal range and I stay healthy. Mm. If I'm a military tra trainee, the same thing. My movement puts me up here or what I do every day. And then if I move very well, it moves me back down. Mm. And I think that's why the one study at the university that put all their intercollegiate athletes so in the pool. if you're a good mover. A good be mover. Because you're a good mover, even if you're in a place of high variability, you actually have less variability. Yeah. what you're saying. It, well, to me, this right. is where like... I I think of I always think of the hurdle step in the so where you have to step over that string in the in the FMS and mm -hmm. if you score really well on that you look like a robot you're just like Shh, everything's moving in perfectly in plane and there's nothing kind of going out of plane and so to me that's a it's a very consistent very um, efficient movement I'd say it looks very yeah. efficient but to me if I'm always running in a straight line and turning left and I'm always doing it with these very consistent movement patterns I may be the one who gets hurt and so. I was, I was the one who had to score these FMS videos because I was the only one that was FMS certified in the team of researchers. Mm. And so I had to look at all these videos. And I, there was one guy in the video that did three hurdle steps because that's what you have to do for the FMS. You do three and you take the best rep. Mm. And he did three different compensations on three different reps. So the first one, he like flung his leg around to the side. The second one, he tilted the stick to one side. And the third one, he flexed through his spine. Mm. So I saw three different very uh, compensations on three different reps. And I was like... I watched that like a bunch of times over and over again. I was like, I've never seen that before. That's so hmm. weird. So he's a really variable mover. He finds a way to make it happen with different strategies over three reps. Did, did mm. he get like, uh, now can you do it without flinging your leg to the side? And then he tilted. No, no. Yeah, you're not supposed to give them feedback. Gotcha. It was just, I don't know how, how this happened. But so he's just, he just has all these different strategies that he uses. And I remember seeing that and being like, well, FMS criteria is if there's compensations, it's a two. So I watched three of them. I'm like, well, he's got compensations. He's a two. So I circled it. And I moved on. And then when we got the results back, I was like, I wonder if that guy got hurt or not. So I went back into my data. Mm. What do you think based on what I just told you? He didn't get hurt. No, no. he was a healthy guy. Mm. Yeah. But to me, the next part of that equation. So after we did this study um, and I started to explain it that way. So to me, basically, because the sport puts them in the low variability group, if you move a little wacky, that moves you up into the normal variability you right. don't get hurt so after i did this study because the track coach allowed us to do the study with their athletes i had to go meet with them and explain the results and i was thinking about am i going to go into this yeah this right. meeting and say okay coach Start what i want you to do if you got an athlete that moves really well like, fuck them up like make them move <laughs> on <crazy. laughs> mm -hmm. like no i'm not going to say that right, right and right. so um what i told them was like how about on wednesday you turn right yeah. Right. Is that yeah. so wacky? <laughs> right? yeah. Or right. or maybe like play a game of soccer every once yeah. in a while or, or run up and down a hill. And I think if we did it in – because most of the athletes that do the long-distance track also do cross-country. Mm -hmm. And I think if we did it in cross-country season, we'd find something different because they're going up and down hills. Mm -hmm. They're turning mm -hmm. right. They're turning left. They're getting yeah. variability. And, mm -hmm. um, and so this is where I think we got to start thinking about these things a little bit more and understanding um, – you know, people do move differently and, and we need to figure out how to keep everyone healthy. And so to me, uh, it really depends on kind of what you do every day and how you do it. And so you have to kind of enter all those factors in. Uh, I was working with a guy down at the beach where I live and he used to say he'd, he'd run. He was getting a lot of knee pain on one side. He said he would run. He'd go down to the beach and he'd run along the beach mm. to the mm. end of the strand. Then he'd go up to the strand and run back. And so down by the beach, it's slanted like this. Mm. And then the strand is flat. And so he would always run on this. And like, obviously, mm. that's uneven stresses. Right. So yeah. I told him, man, if you're going to run on the beach run down and then run back so you're this way that way and then this way coming mm -hmm. back and so mm -hmm. and then also with, with runners i mean it is such a 
constant repetitive sport and a lot of runners have their constant route they take so they're like mm. i go out of my house i turn left i go down the hill i turn right they always do the same way like why not go the other way mm. every second day to get a little variability and try to to keep you healthy uh, but the second part of that uh, why we haven't published it yet is I'm still waiting for the performance piece. So we went through all that data. I had a student go back and mine the data from the NCAA records and get each athlete's personal best time in each of their events during that season. And then because all they, they all had different events, we divided it by the NCAA standard in that mm. event. So mm. we had a couple hundred meter athletes who ran, I don't know, 11 something as their personal best that uh, that season. And we divided it by 10, I don't know what the nine something is. The uh, probably about 10 two. 10 two. Yeah, I don't, something I don't really know. Yeah. So they're going to be a one point whatever. So if you're a one, if you're a one, you're the NCAA record holder. And we don't have any of those people at Florida. Right. No. <laughs> no. And so we had people who are 1.2, 1.3, 1. point whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and so the lower number, the better. So that was our performance variable. And if they ran multiple events, we just averaged their multiple events together to give them one number for performance. And our hypothesis is you might find the opposite of um, what we found with the injury. I would find that the consistent movers are probably the faster runners. And so to me, hmm. we don't want to mess up their movement patterns because it probably make them slower. Because I don't think we've never found, I've never seen any evidence of a correlation. I think there might be the odd one in the in the literature, but there's not many between performance variables and FMS scores. Yeah, right, right. But to me, in an event like just straight up running, it could be there. So if there's, you know, if you're a, a wacky mover, if you think like if I'm recovering after every step and doing what that guy did and swinging my leg around to the side and somebody else is mm. recovering straight through, they're probably going to be faster. They're getting through that recovery phase into the propulsive phase a lot faster mm -hmm. than me. They're probably going to be faster. So I... I don't know if we're going to find anything. Even if we find a little bit of a trend towards that, um, that could tell us that, you know, you don't want to mess up the patterns of the people who are moving well. Mm. You, what you want to do, I think, is introduce some variability somewhere else. So whether it's turning left on Wednesdays, whether it's uh, playing a game of soccer, running up and down hills the odd time. Uh, one thing that I talked to them about was what you do in the gym all, every day. So to me, if my sport, every day when I'm practicing, if I'm only moving in the sagittal plane like these runners do, mm. why don't we do some like slide board stuff in the frontal plane or do some transverse plane rotational med ball throws in the gym to give us the variability in the gym that we need to stay healthy. Mm -hmm. And this is what I'm finding with a lot of the people who are working in pro sports. There isn't a whole lot you can do in terms of getting people stronger and better during season because right. most pro sports they're playing every second night i mean i do some work with the anaheim ducks in uh nhl i think on average they play once every second or third night and they're practicing in between you can't really get stronger and so what what you want to do in the gym is just undo all the bad stuff that you do on the <laughs> ice so that right. you don't get hurt. Mm -hmm. And so I talked to a lot of people that I know in hockey about this and hockey, they get out on the ice and they do a lot of frontal plane hip stuff. They have to push out to the side. Mm -hmm. So when they come to the gym, are we going to do slide board stuff? Probably not. They already got a shitload of that on the ice. So let's do sagittal plane and transverse right. plane stuff in the gym with them. I do a ton of work in golf. What do golfers do? Swing one way. Transverse plane rotation too. Yeah. And so do we want to do rotational med ball throws with a guy who just hit 300 balls on the range and then played around a golf? No, he just got a shitload of that already so maybe we go the other way sure that might be a good idea mm -hmm. to do some left-handed ones or throw them the opposite way or do some sagittal plane and frontal plane stuff mm -hmm. to get the, mo the the variability we need to stay safe and yep. so i think there always is that trade-off between performance and safety um like i said i mean i always tell my students you know you could throw the safest baseball pitch ever and never hurt yourself <laughs> but the performance is going to be shitty but if you wanted to throw a 90 mile or a fastball you got to put some things at risk of injury and so mm -hmm. um managing that where do we go along that performance and safety curve so to me if i'm a runner and i only train in the sagittal plane i'm going towards the performance side and just ignoring safety but mm. if i blow up my achilles my performance is going to be pretty bad too so um, yeah that's something we got to start thinking about a little bit and, and deciding, you know, where do we draw those lines in the sand in terms of, you know, how much performance. But to me, most of the people that I've worked with in pro sports in season, I mean, off season is a whole different thing, but in season, it's really about just maintenance and keeping them healthy and keeping them out there. Yeah, I think for a lot of the sagittal plane athletes that listen to this show, you know, weightlifters, powerlifters, crossfitters in many ways, being out of season or far away from a competition, doing more uh, more agility work, more more lateral work, right. more, um, more, more high high explosive jumping, um, mm. rotational throwing, et cetera, right. et cetera. Like all the things that you don't normally do in a, in a crossfit weightlifting or powerlifting competition is, is, is a very good thing. Not yeah. just not just to be a better athlete and be injury free, but it's just to be well rounded, sure. which is yeah. in, in a lot of cases for, for crossfitters, they pride themselves on not being the best at anything, but really good at everything. And right. if you're avoiding all, you know, throwing things and agility work and sure. sprinting, et cetera, then you're not truly well rounded in an athletic sense. 
although totally. of course they're amazing athletes yeah uh, i have a question for you so um you you mentioned greg cook who's talked about functional movement screen uh he he worked with shirley salmon in some context with 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 building that um from what i know yeah uh, and then also if i'm not mistaken you were you were the person that worked with Stuart mcgill mm-hmm. that you yeah. said yes yeah. that's right so they all have very similar things to say around uh, the, the low back and the hips around around st- stability and mobility mm-hmm. and, and how the low back should be trained yeah um number one do, are you are you uh, comfortable talking about that topic sure. uh, with yeah, what, yeah. With yeah, what yeah. McGill has has sure. put out over the years, yeah, yeah, uh, and or you know where do those thoughts come from, and and what's what's the big picture there? I mean, I, I was schooled in um, Stu McGill's you know science and methodology because I did my postdoc at uh, the University of Waterloo where he's based, so I sat in on his spine biomechanics class and I've talked to all his grad students and what I mean a lot of the stuff he says makes a whole lot of sense and I've I put it into p- practice because I've worked with a lot of athletes I've worked with a lot of general people and basically he says the lumbar spine is not designed to move um, it's not a very efficient looking system if you think about it we got that big hunk of mass that's our rib cage and our thorax and a big hunk of mass which is our pelvis and then we got this little strand in between this little bar like if i build a building where there's a big hunk of mass and this little thing and then a big hunk of mass that thing's going to fall over and so to me the musculature around it is designed to lock that down and then move through the more efficient ways to move which are the ball and socket joints the hips and the shoulders are really efficiently mm. designed to move the way this thing is designed you look you're like if if i was building a building that looked like that i'd be like um I, i'm not meant to move through there this whole thing's going to fall mm. over and collapse and and so um, I got really schooled and it made a ton of sense to me. And, and I've found that basically when I work with people with back problems, generally they move too much through their back. Mm. And if you can stop them from moving through their back, which is like the, the joint by joint approach that Mike Boyle and Gray Cook invented, which I mean, you have to take it with a grain of salt for what it is. But to me, if you can make the hips and shoulders move better and reduce the motion through the lumbar spine, that's something that generally takes people's back pain away. Um, and so it makes a lot of sense to me, but and so I don't know if you guys are familiar with the whole bracing versus uh, hollowing debate. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're mm-hmm. familiar with that. Um, so there's a lady I don't I don't even know who she is, but in uh, I, I I mean I, I can't think of her name off the top of my head, but there's a lady in Australia who um, is the bracing expert, or sorry, the hollowing. She 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 says we should hollow, we should suck mm-hmm. our belly button closer to our spine before we right. lift mm-hmm. and Stu's not he you wants to brace so just to isometrically activate everything um and i didn't know that this was the whole debate when i was at uh hmm. waterloo and then i went to a conference while i was there um it in phoenix arizona and we were at a bar one night after the conference and i met this guy that was at the conference and we started chatting he was a good a nice australian guy we we're having beers and stuff and he's like, so where do you work? I'm like, oh, I'm at the University of Waterloo. And he looks at me, he's like, who do you work with? And I mentioned that name. Mm-hmm. He's like, ooh, we can't be friends. <laughs> I was like, what are you talking about? He's like, well, my supervisor and your supervisor, like if they got in the same room, like World War Three breaks out. And I was like, what are you talking about? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and so <laughs> that's so that's so true of academia too, by the way. Yeah. Like, it's like, what's that got to do with you and I? I know. <laughs> 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 what? No, but we... we it's not my dad. Like, right. <laughs> we're, well, anyways. I mean, and so God. after several, several beers that night, he was a good dude. I don't really care. I mean, it doesn't bother me, but he... Yep. Uh, Got to get him drunk so he can totally. take him down. That's how well, that no. works. <laughs> After several beers, Keep we came hostage. Up. We have one of yours. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Admit you're wrong. Don't, don't publish that paper. <laughs> <laughs> no, but after several beers, we, we figured out a plan. Say, say, this is what we're going to do. We're going to go to a conference, and we're going to somehow get them both there, and then we're going to lock them in a room and say, you're not coming out till you figure this shit out. One mm. knife. <laughs> oh. <Yeah. laughs> Make it spicy. One man leaves. Yeah. Yeah. But to me, that's uh, that would be if, if somehow they could get together and design a study to you know, answer some of these questions. Cause I think a lot of times experts kind of say the same things. They just use different yeah, terms to sure. say it. Cause yeah. Yeah. I mean, I studied a lot of Shirley Simon and Vladimir Yonda stuff. And I remember I'd go to these conferences and people be like, are you a Yonda person or a Simon person? And I was like, I don't know. It kind of sounds like they're saying the same they're thing. A lot they're of crossover using there. different words. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't even and put them in that different categories. No, really. No, no. Well, I mean, Yonda supposed to be more of a neurological type person. Simon's a little more biomechanical, but mm-hmm. I think again, that they are using, you know, similar terms. So, um, like, 
uh, Yanda would call something like a structural or a functional pathology, where mm. um, Sarman calls it a pathokinesiologic or kinesiopathologic, where to me they're basically <laughs> the same thing. They're just using a different so, word. So different. I'm smarter. No, I'm smarter. <laughs> so different. Use my word. Yeah. Hashtag. So, but, uh, What's well, interesting, I, I wouldn't have thought there was like conflict between the two because I, I see way more similarities than differences. Yeah. Well, so that's, that's the thing. I, I don't know the answer to that, but I think for the good of society, it would be great if the two of them work together and, and, you know, I don't care if I'm right or you're right. I want to find the answer. That's what science right. should be. Mm. Um, and so, I, I mean, but I, I have great respect for Stu McGill. I mean, I've, I did a lot of work for him. He's, he taught me a heck of a lot. Um, and he, he's done a lot of really awesome stuff that's helped us, uh, understand a lot of stuff about uh, the low back a lot better and, and overall movement pattern. So, um, and you, you know, like you, you, without saying anything, like you can't, put yourself out there that much without being wrong about something. Yeah. And when somebody like that who's tried so much and, and has been, you made so much progress, you're going to miss on a couple of them. Well, yeah. <laughs> but again, I think it's a variability issue. So like sometimes, I mean, maybe there's some people on this planet that, that hollowing does work for, but who are those people? I don't know. I mean, yeah. and, and maybe there's some people, I mean, I've had a lot of success. Like I said, you know, with my Stu McGill methods. Um, I mean, I, I trained a guy when I was in my postdoc who had, five complete posterior herniations of his L4, L5 disc. Oh. And on the fifth one, he paralyzed himself from the level of the herniation down. Uh -huh. And so once he was kind of back up and moving again, he came to see me and I trained him for a bit and I implemented a lot of stuff Stu taught me and like, he got a lot better. <laughs> right. uh, I remember at one point he was, he was doing like a, and this is what Stu talks about. You kind of want to increase that margin of safety because most back injuries, especially like disc herniations are like the, um, David Beckham injury I talked right. about, right? It's not like one yeah. thing that causes Sneezed it. Or it's whatever, over time, yeah. right? It's And so, yeah, you sneeze or you roll over in bed or you reach for a pen and you're like, how does reaching for a pen? Or well, you hang not. on an inversion table. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just happened to Mike. <laughs> Dude <laughs> fell mean, over crippled. Two, two he was like, Doug, come get me. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> two weeks ago, I'm like, I just like, I'm in a gym and I see an inversion table and I get in it. Yeah. I lay back and then all like 10 seconds later, sharp pain in my lower back on oh. the left side. I was like... And you, could you get out of I it? I couldn't. I had to like use my arms. I could. <laughs> I couldn't activate my core. I was just like freaking out, oh, yelling, man. "Doug, help! <laughs> come help me!" He thinks I'm being funny. I'm in excruciating pain. <laughs> That's funny. We were actually on a meeting at the time, like on a phone meeting. Oh yeah, I was, like, I was like, "Ugh, Mike's fucking dicking off." Hold on. <laughs> 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 Yeah, funny. as usual. But yeah, yeah. It's, for for a lot of those injuries, it's not an acute trauma. It's it's just the straw that broke the camel's it back. It builds up over time. And so I remember one time I was training him, and I I had to, and I think a lot of what I learned through a lot of the FMS stuff was, um, I mean, I think to me, if you're moving so poorly that you're herniating discs by moving, it means you don't know how to move anymore. Like you've, if you're injuring yourself by moving, you've lost the ability to move. And so what we need to do is reteach you how to move. Mm -hmm. And how do we, how, how did all of us learn how to move? Well, we came home from the hospital and we got put on our back in the crib and we learned how to move. And then eventually we learned how to roll over and then we could crawl. And, and so I think a lot of the stuff that people are doing now is really awesome work where, I mean, a lot of people are looking at breathing. I mean, I know mm -hmm. a lot of lifters are looking at, you know, doing that type of breathing training to get them out of using the accessory muscles. And, and if you can't breathe properly, I mean, that's the first movement all of us have to do, right? We went from a water environment to an air environment. And all of a sudden, if we can't get air in our other lungs, we're not going to live very long. So that was the first movement that we all learned as kids. And it's funny, I've had a bunch of, my brothers have both had little girls. And so I've had access, not access, but I've had little babies around. And so I've watched them. Like I was, I literally watched my little niece just lying there breathing for like hours and I got mesmerized. It was mm. unbelievable how efficiently she was like the little belly was moving up and down. There was no movement in her chest or her mm. shoulders. And like, you're like, wow, that's really cool. Like you don't have to teach them that. that just, they just get it. Mm. Um, and that's where I like, you know, watch my little niece cruising around and go down to pick up something off the ground. And she just drops her ass right to the floor and stands up with the thing. And you watch people in the gym and they're like, Ugh, restricted here. And so we, I think a lot of what we do every day messes us up. And then our goal is to get back to moving like we did when we were little kids. And so that's what I was doing with this guy. I was training him and literally he'd come in for an hour and a half training session. And we'd say, hey, Mr. So-and-so, how you doing? And I'd say, get on the floor. And then he'd work out for like an hour and a half and he'd get up and shake his hand and go shower. Wow. Like we did not do anything that wasn't on the ground because he couldn't do anything on the ground. He didn't move well enough to be. Huh. And if you think about it, you got to walk before you can run both literally and figuratively. And you got to crawl before you can walk and you got to breathe before 
before you can crawl. You got to roll before you can crawl. Yeah. And so we went back along that chain and started to teach him. And this is kind of the stuff that I got from Gray Cook and a lot of the the um, Stu McGill stuff. And he was getting way better, which I think to me was increasing his margin of safety between mm. movements and injury. And so he was doing like a chop. We got to like a you know a mm. cable chop. And he was doing this cable chop, and he was keeping his core nice and stable. And he did five or six, and he got to the seventh one, and he kind of lost his core, and he kind of went like this. Ugh. And he looked at me with this look of sheer terror in his face because a couple months earlier, had he done that, he'd be oh, yeah, paralyzed. Yeah. yeah. And he'd be, uh, and he he told me the story that like your bladder control is below this level of your spine. So he's like a 40 year old something year old man, and he had to wear a diaper, mm. and he was in a wheelchair. Like that's not cool. Oh. He had a little baby at home. <laughs> so he's doing these chops and like. Oh, he does this and he looks up to me with this sheer terror on his face and then he kind of wiggles around a little bit and he's like, wait, that didn't hurt. And then he looked at me again and then just like waterworks bawling, crying. Huh. I was like, this is awkward. <laughs> 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 I don't do well with crying. I thought you were going to say, like, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of you. He did a good job. <laughs> this is, this is <laughs> awkward, bro. Dude, uh, get knock out. that shit off. Stop. <laughs> You're making me uncomfortable. Knock it off. <laughs> you can get yeah. out. I, d- <laughs> no, I didn't say that. you got to pay two <laughs> sessions right now. I mean, you're yeah, in a gym cost setting, right? Like you're, sure. you're in testosterone heaven here in this gym, and, <laughs> and, he's, and there's this big guy. Like he literally was like 6'5 or something like that, and he's a big dude. Right. And he's cr- so I shuffled him off to the trainer office, and I remember him telling me, like, I threw a ball with my son for the first time last week, and he could do all this stuff that, like, he couldn't do before. And so I think mm. that little movement, which would have put him over the edge, that would have been the straw that broke his back previously, mm. you know, as he would learned to move better mm. and, and let those structures heal themselves a little bit, um, gave him that little bit of safety. So... Um, I think there's there's definite um, there's a lot there. I mean, as much as um, you know, people might criticize Stu McGill. He's got a lot of really yeah, good yeah. stuff to say. Absolutely. I mean, and uh, and I think to me again, you just have to keep that variability piece in your head all the time. So you know, the best thing for you might be the absolute worst thing for you, and we got to figure out you know what's the exercise. So whenever everybody asks me what's the best thing to do when I have a bad back, I'm like, it depends. And then obviously the next question should be, it depends on what, (laughs) and then you got to have something there. And so that's where we've, I mean, I've tried to work with some really simple ways that I can teach my students that they can, you know, run some people through tests. And to me, like for a bad back, I think a lot of bad backs are either like extension intolerant, they don't like extension or flexion intolerant, they don't like flexion. Mm -hmm. So the two FMS screening tests that I really like are the flexion and extension screening tests. So basically if somebody comes to me and says, and has a bad back, I say, do the Cobra pose and do the child's pose and tell me which one you like better. If they get in Cobra and they're like, oh my God, that feels amazing. Because I did it with this guy with the posterior herniation. Mm-hmm. He got in Cobra pose. He's like, oh, I could hold this all day. This feels awesome. He got in child's pose. He's like, I don't like that so much. Mm-hmm. So guess what? He's flexion and tolerant. Makes sense with the posterior herniations. So right. then everything we did was to figure out the patterns we could do to keep him out of flexion. Mm-hmm. And so one of the things I talk to my students about, and I think it's really important, is that, I mean, I'm a biomechanist. When I went to school and took kinesiology, they make you take everything, sports psychology, sociology, all that stuff. And I remember being there and being like, what is this psychology crap? I don't like this stuff. I agree. You like, know, I agree. To me, it was so wishy-washy, right? I actually had the same problem. I remember going to this, I'm like, oh. Yeah. It's like, I can just, I'm good at working out. Right. <laughs> 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 Nobody wanted to take sports psych well, in I graduate d- school. For I, some I remember no. when Nobody I went did. to school, I wasn't going. I wasn't going to school to teach anybody else or to even coach. It was yeah. because I was interested in my own athleticism. Right, right. Me too. And sports psychology, I'm like, I can train. I've got no problem like doing whatever I want. Totally. I'm mentally strong. Yeah, yeah. So that's yeah. funny. I remember. But, na- but now I love. That's like my favorite subject. I know. It's totally. kind of funny. Yeah. 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 That's what, I mean, I always joke with Lenny. They just talk about their feelings all the time. You just walk into class and talk about your feelings. <laughs> like, how can you get that wrong? It's just your feelings, right? <laughs> um, and I remember I had a, a buddy who taught this uh, philosophy class um, when I was in school, and I used to always make fun of him because, like, philosophy, like, oh, come on. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and my favorite movie when I was a kid was Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Mm. And so there's that scene where he, they meet Socrates. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he comes up and he's like, all we are is dust in the wind, dude. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And so I remember he was teaching when I was in grad school and I used to be a big joker. And he was teaching in a classroom with like 100 kids, his sport philosophy class. And I walk in, I'm like, all we are is dust in the wind, dude. And then I walked out. <laughs> that's all you got to know about philosophy, really, right? <laughs> totally. totally. <laughs> Dude, like philosophize with them. That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> sorry, where was I going with that? I don't know. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so this guy um, that had posterior herniations, mm. he um, 
He was 6'5", I told you, but he was super shy. Mm. And I remember we were I was doing all my Stu McGill stuff with him, and I was doing all my Great Cook stuff, and I was getting him better. And I, But he wasn't getting better at the rate that I thought. I thought he should be doing progressing a little quicker. Mm. And uh, I watched him walk in the gym one day. So I'm working at the table doing my paperwork or whatever, and I watched him walk in the gym, and he was like 6'5". He was a big dude. And if you think about it, I had a buddy that was on the volleyball team when I was in college, and we used to go to bars and stuff and clubs. And we would get together at the start of the night. This is before cell phones, right? I didn't have a cell phone back then. And we'd be like, okay, if we get separated during the night, at the end of the night, we'll meet at him. <laughs> right? Because his head's like this far above everybody, right? So uh, you look right, around right. the bar, you're like, yeah, there he is. And you go over and everybody meets there and we go home. Yeah. And so that's what this guy's like. He's 6'5 and he's so tall, he's above everyone. And so I literally watch him walk into the gym, look around at all these people, and then get down to everybody else's level. Mm. Uh, which puts his spine in deflection right. all the time. And so part of the training I had to do with him was like psychology training. And I wish I had to pay more attention in psychology class because I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. <laughs> 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 um, and so that's where that's what I try to tell my students that's why we teach all this stuff like it's not just for fun yeah. like it's it's important and to me like if you're working with a human being and you're not thinking about psychology you're not doing the best for them possibly because mm -hmm. Lenny has a great line that he uses whenever a student asks him like do I need to know this <laughs> or am I going to have to use this later or whatever right. he always says I don't know uh, tell me in 10 years right like, tell me in 10 years if you need to know it or not. Totally. Mm. Yeah. No, I agree. Oh, fucker. Yeah, that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, it seems every coach that I know almost, once they get a handle on the basics of training, right. they almost all go, oh, this is really a psychological game. 100%. Like, all, yeah. all the, knowing, knowing how to program right workouts and teach movement yeah. and, and, and whatever – that's the basics. Sure. You're supposed to know that yeah. shit. But, but learning, <laughs> yeah. learning how to get people to to follow you and, uh, and to actually do what they're supposed to be uh -huh. doing and and to want to do it for their reasons yeah. and to like be able to manage like their 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 whole mentality and and, and their life and like be a part time therapist for them, etc. That's that's ninety percent what you do. I agree, but it's still yeah. fun to make fun of Lenny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you got to make fun of your friends. <laughs> I got one one last question. Uh, I, I actually want to go back to the uh, the suit with the EMG. Okay. The Athos, right? Yeah, yeah. Athos. 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 Whatever you want to call it. So you were talking about, before we started the show, you mentioned the suit, but you were talking about there's also accelerometers built in. Is mm -hmm. that right? Yes, yeah. So could you talk to us? So EMG can be a little fickle at times. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but when coupled with accelerometer, you're getting a lot more data. Sure. And how do you how are you using that data together? So I, I think it, we were they're working on coming up with something you know similar to um, like catapult or one of those things that measure load on the athlete, which mm -hmm. is basically you know how much acceleration your body does as you're moving. Um, and a lot of a lot of people are using that now to to prescribe work rest cycles to say you know you've got to this load it's time to rest or whatever. Um, and so the accelerometer can give us that information. But and so if you only have that information, we both might do the same amount of work like acceleration wise. But without the EMG data, we're not really sure. Like, y you might have to shut yourself down, but me, I could be fine. And so what we're doing now with the, with the EMG data is we're actually taking the area under the EMG curve. So you could put this suit on and go out and play a game of soccer for two hours. And it'll tell you through the accelerometer data how far you ran and, or how much accelerations your body had or how much external load you had on your body. But if we both had the same external load on our bodies and your hamstring has been used to like 200% of its capacity and my hamstring's only been used to 50% of its capacity, I was more efficient out there and I can keep going, mm. but you need to be shut down. And so it gives you that individual mm. muscle load, which tells me, because all, all load on, a, on an athlete is not created equal, depends mm. on how you're producing that load. So if you're like maxing all your muscles out, or maybe you're using your, ham your right hamstring to 300% and your left one to 20%, and I'm using mine equally to maybe 60% each that's a whole different story so it gives us a much more individual look into how those loads are affecting each athlete yeah and, and to reference uh you know greg cook and mike boy and all those guys again uh one of the things that they say is that movement asymmetry is one of the, the largest predictors of injury so in that in that case using one hamstring you know double the other one in this oversimplified example right. that, that's that's a red flag that something is is wrong that needs to get fixed or you're you're looking to get hurt eventually yeah. and to me if i if i had this gear at the time we did the fms study you know when you're only running straight and turning mm. left i guarantee you we're we would have found something like that yeah. that would have led to the injuries and the people we saw injuries so mm -hmm. to me this technology now allows us to look into stuff like that which where previously we couldn't have um so i mean we had previously our emg system here you had to be tethered to the computer by a big long wire so clearly we can't put it on track athletes who are running around the track right. um and then we invented there they came up with these um 
telemetered systems that you didn't have to be connected by a wire, but you still had to have a whole bunch of wires on mm -hmm. you, so it was mm -hmm. still hard to move. But mm -hmm. now if you can just wear, like, with this Athos gear, and this is where when I first started working for Athos, I was, like, skeptical because you're taught as a scientist to be skeptical, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I've worked with enough EMG data. And it's so fickle. It's so hard to get. The electrode has to be in the right spot. There has to be gel there. You have to abrade the skin and shave and all this stuff to get a good signal. And I was like, how the hell are you guys getting a signal from this? There's no way that's even possible. And then they collected some data and they showed me the raw signal. And I was like, holy cow, that looks amazing. Like, I couldn't even believe that you could. And the mechanics mm -hmm. of how they do it, I don't even understand. Like, you collect it on your skin. It ships up to the cloud. I don't know how it does that. And then it comes back down into your phone. I'm like, yeah. that's amazing what they can do. Yeah. So technology is just ridiculous. I mean, I always tell the Athos people, when I took my first EMG course in grad school, um, the electrical activity that comes out of a muscle is a very low great electrical activity mm. and there's tons of electrical activity around us all the time these cameras the computer there's tons of and so discerning what's emg and what's the rest of the shit in the air is really hard to do yeah um and so i think i don't know the year exactly on this but it was not very long ago i'm gonna go i'm not even gonna guess at the year but not very long ago emg could only be collected in this electrically neutral cage mm. that this guy basmagian created he's one mm. of the first guys who did emg so he created this cage that was like a it was shielded from all of their electric electrical activity and he could collect emg in that cage mm. so basically i don't know let me take a guess 50 years ago let's say emg could only be collected in one cage in the world anywhere right mm. and we're only oh and we're not long out of that and now you can put this suit on and be wherever with your phone and collect EMG, really good EMG data. I'm like, it's unbelievable that we've gotten yeah. that far. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll add a little piece to that physiology. If you're wondering, if you're like, or asking yourself like, how in the hell do muscles give away electricity? Uh, the way that you basically contract is your nerves send a signal and it's just an electrical signal. And when it gets into your muscle, it's the same thing. So it gets converted from electrical into chemical and then chemical back into electrical. And you just have a, a, a literally a difference between a positive charge and a negative charge. Those get flipped and it shoots off this electrical signal and that causes your muscle to contract. And so you can actually then reverse and say, okay, if a muscle contracts, it must have caused or the result of that muscle contraction is then the electrical signal. So if you measure that electrical signal, that's why you can measure heart activity or any other thing. And that's how you can get an electrical signal from. Right. And the, the generally, the, like, the more, I always tell my students, the more electrical activity your brain sends down that highway to the muscle, the harder it's going to contract. And so right. we're basically measuring the magnitude of that. And the magnitude of that does is pretty variable like i mean if you take an emg electrode and you hit it it can give you a big spike yeah which isn't an emg activity that's just a and so i think i like a lot better with the way athos is going now in terms of giving you emg over a big long period of time and yeah. averaging it versus those little spikes that could be very really variable so yeah. um to me like i want to know how hard your hamstring worked during that two hour workout yeah versus your right versus your left that that's pretty accurate i think and pretty good information because it's averaged over a really long period of time so taking the area under that curve i think is going to be a lot more useful to us than the little spikes that can happen here and For there. For sure. So, yeah. but, and then combining it with the work, the external work that's happening with the um, the, uh, the um, elect, uh, accelerometers, I think is going to be pretty exciting in terms of where that product could go. I'm going to have to get yeah. a suit. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Need one. Yeah. Scott, thanks for uh, having us in your lab and no coming on the show today. Really enjoyed it. Awesome. It Thank you, guys. Uh, uh, is if people wanted to reach out to you, uh, is there any way we can contact you? Social media, or websites, or, oh, or email if you I'm want. If you want to throw it out there, you're welcome to. You don't have to though. What's that? Um, yeah, I have social media. I, I don't even know the whatever you call them. What do, what do you call that? Yeah, Instagram handle? or Facebook yeah. or your name. Handle is that we call a handle uh, for which some one? people call it a handle. Yeah. Mm. Which yeah, one? like where do you put your booty shots? <laughs> <laughs> right. Do you do selfies in the mirror with, with a duck face? <laughs> <laughs> Oops. You don't have any of those, unfortunately. You're on Instagram. <laughs> Instagram, yeah. I don't even know what my thing is, so handle yeah, is that what you call it? Yeah, Scott Lynn. I don't know what it is though. SK um, Lynn or something. I don't even know. Are you know. on Facebook too? <laughs> Facebook, yeah. <laughs> okay. You, you, you don't sound like concerned about. I'm not that concerned. My right. email is fine. S L Y N N at Fullerton. Edu is how okay. they could get me. That's old school, I guess. But um, yeah, yeah, I do have it. I'm not very good at using it so maybe seeing yeah. a trend here all the academics are like yeah uh, i don't really do the self promotion <laughs> <laughs> except for andy it's, it's hard <laughs> man it man. takes it's, a it does. huge chunk of waste of your time <laughs>
<laughs> to do it. But it's, uh, yeah. it. I mean, it's the way that people are getting information these days. That's what I was talking about in terms of yeah. like publishing papers that sit in academic journals that nobody uses. Is that useful? Maybe, yeah. you know. That was the research. number one breaking reason why I finally broke and did it. Yeah. It's because I was just like, well, you have to fight this battle of feeling like a whore and feeling <laughs> like <laughs> a well, That's because you're doing the duck face in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> you're supposed to be publishing whore. useful information. <laughs> I give the people what they want. <laughs> <laughs> Go look at my Instagram. The market decides. I, I'm, I'm, def <laughs> I'm definitely catering to the masses. Right. <laughs> yeah. All right, Scott. That's thanks awesome. again for coming All right, on the show. Thanks, guys. Yeah, that was awesome. awesome.